last time on Reboot. Looks like your dream has finally come true, Dot. Stay exactly where you are. Surrender! Surrender! Now who would be fool enough to disturb my sector's order and calm? Bob! Dot! What is happening? I suggest we break Miss Matrix's spirit once and for all. Your struggle for independence is over. No, it's gone. Everything. <laughs> when we last left our heroes, James, Jesse, and Meowth were in Slateport City, about to begin a new Pokemon adventure in Hoenn. But unlike a normal journey, this one began not with excitement and enthusiasm, but with apprehension and worry. Jesse and James recently had many of their Pokemon stolen by Butch and Cassidy, two agents from a group called Team Rocket. This left the duo with only Growly, Chansey, and the newly caught Chimeco and Wobbuffet, as well as a mission. To save their Pokemon by becoming champions. Well, that's not entirely true. James and Jesse do have other Pokemon who weren't with them when Bartholomew and Cassidy made their move. They also have Slowpoke, Lickitung, and Yanma, who are back at James' summer home in Sinnoh. But they both decide to let them remain there. James and Jesse will call on them if needed, but for now, they want to see what new Pokemon Hoenn has to offer. They're gonna need a lot of new friends if they're to rescue their stolen Pokemon. I just hope they're doing alright. That they aren't scared, James says. Don't worry, our Pokemon are tough, and they know that we'll save them. We won't give up, right? Jesse says. No, of course not. We can do this. Meowth, that's right. Leaving the boat Butch and Cassidy rented at the Slateport Harbor, Jesse and James begin their journey to winning the Evergrande Conference and the Grand Festival. Luckily for our heroes, they don't have to go far. Jesse's first contest is right here in Slateport City. In the center of the city is a massive contest hall. The Grand Festival itself is sometimes held right here, so it's one of the biggest venues in all of Hoenn. It's a pretty huge place for Jesse to have her Pokemon Coordinator debut. Outside of the contest hall, Jesse sees about a dozen other coordinators preparing and grooming their Pokemon. Jesse looks down at Chansey, and both of them are a little nervous. Not only is there a lot on the line if they don't win, but they also don't want to make a fool of themselves. James and Meowth try to cheer them up, but as they do, one of the other coordinators approaches them. As she gets close, Jesse recognizes her and yells out, Is that really you? Whitney? Whitney, a trainer from Goldenrod City, is now a coordinator here in Hoenn. Jesse met her at a Pokemon beauty contest, which Whitney won, of course, and the future gym leader is now in Hoenn looking to give Pokemon contests a shot. Jesse's ecstatic to see her again, the two originally bonding over their love of pink Pokemon. Whitney, with her Clefairy in her arms, takes the time to give Jesse some tips, and also explains how contests work. Contests are split into two categories, the Appeal Stage and the Battle Stage. Coordinators and their Pokémon will first need to prepare a dazzling performance in order to qualify for the Battle Stage. Once there, they'll need to win contest battles to get the coveted Ribbon. These battles can be won by knockout like any other, but contest battles also deduct points for failed attacks and lack of style, grace, and coordination. There's a lot that goes into winning a contest. Jesse is, understandably, a little overwhelmed by all the rules. Why did Aston want me to do this again? She asks aloud. Whitney tells her to not worry too much, since this is her first contest, so losing is no big deal. But Jesse decides to tell Whitney what happened to them recently. To inform her that to Jesse, losing is a big deal. If she doesn't qualify for the Grand Festival and win, she may never see her stolen Pokémon again. Whitney can't help but get a little emotional, imagining what it would be like to lose her Pokémon. But she wipes her tears and tells Jesse to stay strong. She can do this, and Whitney will help any way she can. With a friend and rival by her side, Jesse enters the contest hall. James and Meowth cheer for her in the stands, as Jesse and Chansey are the first up in the appeal stage. The appeals end up being a lot harder than Jesse expected. Chansey's singing performance is beautiful, but after watching everyone else, Jessie feels like she didn't do nearly enough. Luckily for her, Chansey's performance, while putting the front row of the audience to sleep, was just good enough to qualify Jessie for the battle stage. As this is the first contest of the season, there aren't as many coordinators here yet, otherwise Jessie likely wouldn't have qualified. But good thing she did, because if there's one thing Jessie learned how to do in the Johto League, it was how to battle. However, she can't forget about the subtle differences in a contest battle. Four coordinators qualify for the semifinals. 
In Jessie's first battle, she's paired up against a trainer by the name of Sheridan, who uses a Roselia. Though it takes some getting used to contest battles, Chansey's experience in the Johto League is able to win her the battle with relative ease, after she lands a super effective Ice Punch. In the finals, Jessie is, unsurprisingly, paired up against Whitney. Jessie's Chansey defeated Milton's Miltank back in Johto to win the Plane Badge, so they're pretty confident going into this battle. However, while Milton was strong, Whitney's on a whole other level, especially in regards to contest battles. Whitney's Miltank is just as speedy and tanky as her uncle's, and she chooses to use Rollout not to attack, but to dodge every Egg Bomb Chansey throws at her. Though no attacks hit either Pokémon, Jessie's points dwindle with each miss. Everyone in the audience can tell Whitney is in charge of this battle. However, just as it seems like Miltank will dodge another Egg Bomb and force Chansey to lose her last point, Miltank stops dead in its tracks. The Egg Bomb hits Miltank directly and knocks the Cow Pokémon out. Jessie is declared the winner by knockout, but even as she's awarded her first contest ribbon of all time, something seems off. This doesn't feel like a victory. Back in the locker room, Jessie walks past James and Meowth and approaches Whitney. You threw that last battle, didn't you? What? No, uh, of course not. You were wiping the floor with me. Don't lie. You threw that battle on purpose. Well, yes. But I had to. When you told me what happened to your Pokémon, I just couldn't bear to see you lose. Whitney, I... I'm grateful you cared enough to do that, but losing on purpose isn't doing Chansey and me any favors. We need to win the whole thing. And if we don't learn on our own and get stronger, we'll never be able to save our friends. Whitney pauses and finally nods. I understand. I'm sorry. I promise I won't go easy on you ever again. The two hug, with Whitney promising to tell her uncle Milton how Jessie is doing. Apparently Milton went on and on to Whitney about the epic Chansey vs. Miltank battle he and Jessie had back in Goldenrod. After the contest, Jesse, James, and Meowth decide to head north to Mauville City, so James can have his first gym battle. Whitney decides to hike to Old Dale Town instead. They wave goodbye to her and begin the hike to Mauville. On the way to Mauville, they pass by the Trick House, and though they would have liked to participate in the King of Tricks game, they have more important matters at hand. Once in the city itself, James wastes no time and heads straight for the gym. There's a lot on the line, and the sooner he collects all 8 badges, the sooner he can see his Pokémon again. The gym leader Watson is an Electric Specialist, and tells James it will be a 2 on 2 battle. Watson sends out Electric, and James sends out Growly. Just looking at the two dog Pokémon, you'd assume they were evenly matched, but when the battle begins, Growly immediately shows how powerful he's gotten. He takes out Electric with a single takedown. Competing in the Indigo League and becoming champion of the Orange Islands has done a lot for Growly's confidence in battle. And against Watson's second Pokémon, Magneton, Growly has no issue. A single Fire Blast takes out the Steel-type and leaves Watson stunned on his side of the arena. It isn't often that gym leaders have their team swept by a single Pokémon. Least of all, one as small and cute as Growly. James is awarded the Dynamo Badge, and won't deny that a small part of him is kind of happy to be back competing for gym badges. It's nostalgic. After the gym battle, the trio pull out a map of Hoenn. They both need to reach a bunch of different cities if they want 8 badges and 5 ribbons, so need to plan their route appropriately. Jesse isn't great with maps though, and with James's experience navigating the Orange Archipelago, he takes charge. While he maps out their route, Jesse decides to wander around the area outside Mauville. She spots a food vendor selling spicy noodles and decides to grab some. Sitting by a park bench, she places her food down for just a second while she gets comfortable, but that one second is all it takes for her food to be gobbled up by a nearby wild Pokémon. A wild Seviper is happily eating Jessie's food, and while most people would be afraid to see a giant poisonous snake behind them, Jessie feels the opposite, furious. This poor Seviper just stole food from the wrong person, asked Lickitung. Just like in the anime, Jessie uses Scratch on Seviper, and it's super effective. She catches the wild Seviper and tells it that it's gonna have to work off that meal by winning her a contest ribbon. Returning to James with a new Pokémon in tow, he says the best plan is to head to Pacific Log Town for Jessie's second contest, and then catch a ferry all the way over to Petalburg. It's an odd route, but if they want to succeed, it's the best plan they've got. A sailor in a Waylord-shaped boat is able to bring them from Mauville to Pacific Log where Jessie registers for her second contest. And without Whitney here to help, 
Jessie's gonna have to win this one all on her own. In the appeal stage, Jessie chooses to go for broke and uses her newly caught Saviper. Though it isn't accustomed to performing, Saviper is very, very motivated to not disappoint Jessie. Saviper is able to qualify for the next round after a dazzling display of using Poison Tail to carve Jessie's name right into the stage floor. This contest has eight trainers who qualify for the battle stage. In the quarterfinals, Chansey's able to defeat a trainer Shroomish, who falls asleep to Sing before it can use Spore to do the same to Chansey. And in the semifinals, Wobbuffet wins by casually countering and mirror coding every attack the opposing Linoon throws at him, forcing his opponent to run out of style points. Jesse makes it to the finals once again, and faces off against a trainer who is clearly wearing a wig by the name of Casey. Something seems off about her, but Jessie sends out Saviper to face off against Casey's Sableye. The battle is fairly evenly matched, with both landing and missing as many hits as the other. Saviper's Poison Tail and Sableye's Fury Swipes both look powerful, and it feels like the winner will be decided by one mistake. Luckily for Jessie, Casey is the first to make that mistake. She orders Sableye to use Shadow Ball, but Saviper slices the ball in two with Poison Tail using the momentum to crash down on Sableye and win with a dazzling display of power. Before Jessie can approach her opponent and shake her hand, Casey runs out of the arena. Must be a bit of a sore loser, Jessie says and shrugs. One of the judges, Mr. Contesta, takes center stage with Jessie and awards her her second contest ribbon ever. Though Jessie revels in the applause, the celebration is cut short. Apparently, one of the other contestants lost one of their Pokémon. The authorities advise everyone to clear the contest hall so they can begin their investigation. I guess Officer Jenny wasn't wrong, Jesse says to James outside the hall. Team Rocket really is targeting other trainers here in Hoenn. After the contest, our trio wants to get out of town as soon as possible. However, the two realize that in all of the chaos, many of the scheduled ferries have been diverted. The next ferry to Petalburg isn't until tomorrow. James was afraid that might happen. But luckily for them, a passing sailor says he's on his way to Duford and doesn't mind dropping them off near Petalburg. They'll have to hike a few hours to get to the city, but they're fine with that. Better than waiting around till tomorrow. The sailor takes them just past Duford and drops them off in the outskirts of Petalburg, wishing them good luck and telling them to catch a lot of Pokemon. The trio wave goodbye to the deep-voiced sailor and begin their hike. After a short while, they're stopped in the middle of the road by two wild Pokemon. They both look moments away from battling each other. A wild Cacnea and Slackoth are glaring at each other fiercely, and Meowth steps in to see what the problem is. Apparently, Cacnea was eating fruit underneath a tree that Slackoth was sleeping in. Slackoth accidentally fell out of the tree and right onto Cacnea. Cacnea had its fruit knocked out of its hands, and Slackoth got poked painfully enough that it can't fall back asleep. And no one wants to get between a Slackoth and its nap. James, seeing the two about to attack each other, sends out Chimecho, who calms them both down with Heal Bell. This settles them down long enough for James to pick some new fruit for Cacnea, and fluff some nearby grass to make a nice bed for Slackoth. There, now you have no reason to fight, right? The two wild Pokémon nod as they're given such gifts by the human. Though James can tell they're still a little upset with each other, Cacnea and Slackoth settle down. James, Jesse, and Meowth are about to leave, but the wild Cacnea approaches James. She's already finished the fruit he gave her and clearly wants more. Well, if you want, we have plenty of food. Why don't you come with us? But just as James is about to offer Cacnea a Pokeball, the wild Slackoth runs as fast as a sloth can over to the human. Meowth translates, and Slackoth says, If Cacnea is going with you, then take me too! I can nap twice as well as her. Cacnea pushes against Slackoth and says, Forget him! Take me! And the two seem like they're about to fight again. James decides to stop yet another fight before it happens, and offers both of them a Pokeball. He adds Cacnea and Slackoth to his team, and hopes the two can become close friends. Once they're finally in the city itself, James approaches the Petalburg Gym and challenges the gym leader Norman, who is cheered for in the stands by his wife and a very young May. James decides this would be a good time to try out his newly caught Pokémon and sends out Slackoth. Little did he know, Norman specializes in Sloth Pokémon and also sends out a Slackoth. You remember how Ash once battled a Metapod with a Metapod and it was the most boring battle of all time? Slackoth vs Slackoth makes that battle look like an epic showdown. Both Slackoths do nothing but exchange yawns and encores. 
after about an hour of watching them essentially take turns napping on the arena floor, the judge rules the battle a draw, and both Pokemon are recalled. What was a two-on-two -two battle comes down to just one-on-one. -on -one. Norman sends out Vigoroth, and James decides to send out Cacnea. Although newly caught, James and Cacnea have a natural rhythm together. As fast as Vigoroth is, Cacnea has no trouble keeping up. A well-timed dodge causes Vigoroth to trip on its own feet, and Cacnea is able to deliver the finishing blow with Needle Arm. Thanks to his two new Pokémon, James is awarded his second badge, the Balance Badge. Hopefully these two scrappy Pokémon will be able to find balance between each other as well. Traveling through Petalburg Woods towards Rustboro City, our trio finds navigating through a lot harder than they expected. In the dense woods, they get lost and separated. James, Jesse, and Meowth try to find each other, but seem to just get turned around even more. James in particular becomes frantic trying to find Jesse and Meowth. He's already lost too many friends, and he can't bear the thought of losing them too. Luckily for James, he comes across a small but very kind Pokemon. Sitting in a clearing, meditating and listening to the sounds of the woods, is a wild Pokemon. It's a Ralts! The wild Ralts looks up at the human, and the psychic type can see how lost and scared James is. She offers to help him find his friends. Using her telepathic powers, she senses where Jesse and Meowth are in the woods. She leads James to them, and the group are able to get out of the woods safely and together. After all they went through in the woods, and how kind Ralts was, James decides to offer Ralts a Pokeball. If the little psychic type could help the trio find their way in the woods, maybe she can help them find their other lost friends. Ralts, sensing the intentions of the human, happily joins his team. Out of the woods and back in civilization, there's a lot for the trio to do in Rustboro City, and I'm not talking about tourist stuff. The city will have Jesse's third contest and James's third gym battle. Jesse feels much more confident going into her third contest. With two ribbons in her case, winning here will bring her past the halfway point to qualifying for the Grand Festival. In the appeal stage of the Rustboro contest, Jesse uses Chansey. Creating a dazzling display, freezing egg bomb explosions with Ice Punch, the two easily qualify for the battle stage. The quarterfinals and semifinals are won fairly easily by Chansey and Saviper, both clearly improving their performing skills, not giving up any style points easily. In the finals, Jesse faces off against a trainer named Tucker, who we may recognize as a future member of the Battle Frontier. Jesse sends out Saviper to face off against her opponent's Arcanine. After seeing Growly battle several times now, Jesse knows just how powerful this fire type line can be. Arcanine isn't called the legendary Pokemon for nothing. Saviper attempts to bite Arcanine, but each one misses thanks to the large dog's speed. Jesse's style points dwindle with each miss, and she realizes she needs to play this cool. Learning from her battle with Whitney, Jesse orders Saviper to take things slow to wait for Arcanine to come to him. Instead of chasing after the speedy fire type, Saviper waits patiently, and strikes just as Arcanine is about to attack with an agility boosted takedown. But instead of slamming into Saviper, Arcanine slams right into a powerful poison tail. Using Arcanine's momentum against him, Saviper is able to knock it out in just one hit. Jessie defeats Tucker and earns her third contest ribbon ever. After the contest, more officers show up near the hall. Apparently there was another Pokemon stolen from a coordinator who was eliminated early. Jesse and James feel compelled to do something this time, and approach this town's officer Jenny. They give her all of the info they have on Butch and Cassidy and what happened at the contest from their point of view. She thanks them, telling them they have a few new agents on the case, so everything should be solved in no time. She returns to the investigation. It makes James and Jesse happy to know new people are working on finding the stolen Pokemon, but they're still worried. First the contest in Pacific Log Town, and now Rustboro? What is the connection? Before they leave, James has to enter Rustboro's gym for a battle. While Roxanne will one day be the gym leader here, at this point in time, she'd be far too young. So instead, the gym leader is a man named Mr. Stone. A well-known rock collector and inventor, he will one day found the Devon Corporation. His son, also collecting badges, is, according to him, a prodigy. Team Rocket better think twice before trying to steal my boy's Pokemon, he says. Mr. Stone wants to do nothing more than gush over his son, but James gets his mind back on the task, a Pokemon battle. The battle will be a three-on-three. -three. Mr. Stone sends out Geodude, and James wisely sends out Cacnea. The grass type is a perfect choice for the rock gym, and James expects her to sweep the whole thing. And he's very nearly right. 
Cacnea defeats Geodude easily with Needle Arm, and Mr. Stone's next Pokemon, Ammonite, puts up a stronger fight by getting in a powerful Spike Cannon, but it's ultimately taken out by Needle Arm as well. Against Mr. Stone's third Pokemon, a Nose Pass, Cacnea has more trouble. After missing with Pin Missile, Cacnea is damaged and paralyzed by a surprise Zap Cannon. Defenseless and hurt, the Grass type is then defeated by a powerful Rock Throw. James chooses to send out Ralts next, but the tiny Pokemon's no match for Nose Pass. Unable to land a single attack, Ralts is taken out with a Rock Tomb. James is suddenly down to his last Pokemon and decides to take a risk. He sends out Slack Off. Nose Pass uses Rock Tomb, which slows down the already slow Pokemon. Slack Off then uses Encore, forcing Nose Pass into using Rock Tomb over and over. Each attack makes the Sloth Pokemon slower and slower. And eventually, this becomes too much for even Slackoth to bear. As he's buried under rocks, a light shines and he bursts through. Slackoth has evolved into Vigoroth. With its newfound speed, Vigoroth is able to get in close. With a lightning fast swing, Vigoroth one shots Nose Pass with a newly learned Focus Punch. James defeats Mr. Stone and is awarded his third badge, the Stone Badge. Outside the city of Fall Arbor Town, our trio decides to take a break from traveling and spend some time relaxing, eating, and admiring the beautiful and unique Ashfall. This part of Hoenn is one of the only places to see something like this, and it's an unforgettable sight. As James, Jesse, and Meowth set up a picnic, they decide to let their Pokemon out to join them. While everyone eats and relaxes, one of their Pokemon hears something in the nearby bushes. Chansey, with years of experience as a nurse, can hear the faint sound of whimpering from someone in pain nearby. She waddles away from the group and into the bushes. Jesse looks up and begins to feel nervous. Chansey's been gone too long. Jesse and James both look at each other, fearing the worst, and run after her. Worried they may stumble onto Babaluba and Cassidy trying to steal Chansey, they instead see her nursing an injured Pokemon. A lone wild Wismer was burned by the falling ash from Mount Chimney. Chansey uses her ability Healer to help the Wismer, who can now go back to the wild in peace. But as the group waves goodbye to Wismer, it refuses to leave Chansey's side. Chansey looks up at Jesse, and her trainer doesn't need Meowth to translate. Jesse can tell exactly what Chansey is thinking. Well, looks like you're coming with us, Wismer. As long as you don't think Hitmonlee will get jealous, Chansey. And the group laughs as Jesse adds the wild Wismer to her team, where Chansey can help keep him safe. After their picnic by the volcano, the group heads into town. With her newly caught Wismer, Jessie confidently enters the Fall Arbor contest. She's 3 for 3 on contests so far, and believes that just like Saviper before him, Wismer's gonna win its first contest with ease. And Jessie is dead wrong. Just because Saviper won its first contest ever, doesn't mean every Pokemon can just walk onto a massive stage and excel. Wismer enters the appeal stage, with Jessie ordering it to use Screech. But when Wismer opens its mouth, no sound comes out. The audience is deafeningly silent, and from how Wismer begins shaking and sweating, Jesse learns something she should have considered beforehand. Wismer has stage fright. For the first time, Jesse loses a contest, not even making it past the appeal stage. What's worse, her poor little Wismer is so distraught by the loss, it's too afraid to even leave its Pokeball. Not even Chansey's able to coax him out. Poor little guy. You'd think Jessie would be angry about losing the contest, but all she can think about is poor little Wismer. She tells him, through the Pokeball, to not worry. She won't force it to do anything it doesn't want to again. It was her fault they lost, not Wismer's. Jessie decides to stay and watch the rest of the contest, scoping out the competition. And after seeing the winner's performance, a part of her is almost happy she was eliminated early. A coordinator by the name of Wallace absolutely swept the contest. No one stood a chance against him. After Wallace is given the Fall Arbor Ribbon, the stands begin to empty as everyone leaves. As the trio exits the contest hall and prepares to journey towards Lava Ridge, they notice some commotion at the back of the hall. Two strange people are in the middle of a Pokemon battle. But they aren't battling each other. They're both battling a very small wild Pokemon. Get out of our way! We don't want to steal a weak Pokemon like you! The wild Pokemon appears to be guarding the building against these two people. Two people who happen to be wearing similar clothes to Butch and Cassidy, but who look nothing like Butch and Cassidy. Uh, they must be other Team Rocket agents! Hey, Team Rocket! Jessie says and bursts forward. She runs and stands next to the wild Pokemon. Up close, she can see that it's a Spoink. 
The little pig Pokemon saw the Rocket agents attempt to break into the contest hall, likely to steal Pokemon as Team Rocket has done to contest venues all over Hoenn. Jesse sends out Viper, and both he and Spoink team up to defeat the two agents, and send them blasting off with Poison Tails and Psybeams. For such a small little guy, you sure are tough, Jesse says. To think you stood up against two Rocket agents all by yourself. On behalf of all of the contest participants, thank you. Before Spoint can say anything though, the difficult battle finally starts to wear on him, and he faints into Jesse's arms. Later that evening, in the Fall Arbor Pokemon Center, Spoink awakens with Jesse by his bedside. You have a very determined little Pokemon there, this city's Nurse Joy says to Jesse. The local officer Jenny, who came to get statements from Jesse and James, agrees. Oh, uh, he isn't mine, Jesse says, but Spoink then speaks up and Meowth translates. Oh yes I am. I've been waiting for a trainer who's as tough as I am, the tiny, cute little pig with the heart of a warrior says. A lot of trainers have tried to catch me, but they got nothing on you. I can tell you're the one for me. Jesse adds Spoink to her team, knowing that his bravery and determination to help others is exactly what they need to win the Grand Festival and save their friends. After Spoink is fully healed, the group moves on. Once in Lava Ridge Town, James intends to have his fourth gym battle. Though the gym leader, Flannery's grandfather Mr. Moore, is here, as James approaches, he says he can't battle today. You see, Mr. Moore is on his way to Moss Deep City. The first test launch of a space shuttle is being done there, and they want the gym leader's fire Pokemon present to help contain the flame in case of an emergency. James, however, insists on having a battle first. Please, you have no idea how important it is that I get eight badges. Well, battle or not, that might be a problem. Hmm. Okay, let's have a quick battle. You can use three Pokemon, and I'll just use one. James finds it odd for a gym leader to give their opponent such an advantage, but he doesn't argue. He'll take every easy win he can get. The battle begins with Growly facing off against Torkoal. Torkoal looks like it's barely paying attention, so James thinks this battle will be no problem. But Torkoal casually steps out of the way of every takedown and flare blitz Growly uses. After Growly tires himself out, Torkoal uses Body Slam and defeats the puppy Pokemon. James then sends out Vigoroth, and the speedy Pokemon seems to have a better chance at landing a hit on Torkoal, but Flannery's grandfather orders Torkoal to use Iron Defense, so even when Vigoroth lands a Scratch or Focus Punch, it barely does any damage. Torkoal ultimately uses Flamethrower and defeats Vigoroth. James is down to his last Pokemon. Cacne is a Grass type, so he can't use her, and Chimeco doesn't have the attack power to break through Torkoal's shell. James has no choice and sends out Ralts. The small Pokemon doesn't have a lot of experience, but James believes in her. Ralts uses its confusion and seems to do a bit of damage, but Torkoal bounces back quickly and uses Flamethrower. Ralts is almost taken out instantly, but knowing what's on the line and how badly they need to win, Ralts digs deep and evolves into Curlia. She intends to save James here, just like she did back in the Petalburg Woods. With a newly learned double team, Curlia avoids Torkoal's flamethrower and is able to hit it directly with Psybeam after Psybeam. It looks like the tables have turned, and that James is gonna win, but as he looks up at the gym leader, Mr. Moore doesn't look concerned at all. He orders Torkoal to use Eruption. Though Curlia uses double team, the attack bathes the battlefield in lava. Curlia has nowhere to dodge and is defeated by Torkoal. I can't believe it. James says. Even after evolving and learning new moves, Curlia wasn't nearly strong enough to defeat Torkoal. Are you really a gym leader? James asks. Because what James didn't know was that Flannery's grandfather is the strongest gym leader Hoenn has ever had. After decades of battling, he almost never loses. Mr. Moore has been offered a position in the Elite Four multiple times, but always refuses, saying he much prefers the calm life of a gym leader in his hometown. Mr. Moore leaves Lava Ridge and heads towards Moss Deep, leaving James without a badge. James thinks to himself, that is the person standing between me and saving my Pokemon. I don't know how, but one day I will be strong enough to defeat him. When I agreed to let you help me, I told you I'd still be calling the shots. You will, but we can't make a move without their help. Is this trio that strong? Yes, and trust me, they're determined to catch Team Rocket more than anybody. Fine, Aston, they can help. You won't regret this, Steven.